You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I want to start this show off with a tip of the cap to Trevor May of the uh, of the Oakland A's. Late of the Oakland A's. Yes. yes. 34 years old, retires from the club, goes on Twitch, and rips his owner apart on the way out the door. He becomes the voice of the fan talking about how terrible his owner is. And I had this moment while reading the article about it. Sell the team, dude. Sell it, man. Where I'm just like, I'm like, I'm like, I wish my players left the White Sox and said that Jerry Reinsdorf was a terrible owner. Like, where's our Trevor May? Right? Like, where's our guy that gets so into what the fans want and gets so frustrated with how the team's been run that he blames the owner for it instead of just doing the, uh, you know, the basic thing that you always get from players like, oh, we're trying the hardest we can and, you know, we we know what we got to do and, uh, you know, you just got to have that grind and, uh, you know, I mean, I love being a White Sox. Like, I would love to have a Trevor May moment where a guy leaves. Like, this guy, I'm going to read the statement because I think it's great. And we all know what's going on out in Oakland where they're trying to move the team. And everybody's like, no, sell the team because we want to keep it here in Oakland and we've had terrible ownership for years. But here, here's what he wrote. And I, I, maybe I'll get through the whole thing. Now that my retirement is official, the A's organization and every single person who's a part of it, I love you all, every single one of you except for one guy. And we all know who that guy is. Sell the team, dude. Let someone who actually takes pride in the things they own, own something. There's actually people who give a bleep about the game. Let them do it. Take mommy and daddy's money somewhere else, dork. (laughs) That's amazing. And also, if you're going to be a greedy bleep, own it. There's nothing weaker than being afraid of cameras. So that's the one thing I really struggled with this year was not just eviscerating that guy. Do what you're going to do, bro. Whatever, you're a billionaire. They exist. You guys have all this power. You shouldn't have any of it because you haven't earned any of it. But anyway, whatever. The reality is you got handed everything you have and now you're too soft to stand in front of fans and the team and take any responsibility for anything you're doing. You're putting hundreds if not thousands of people out of work that have worked somewhere for decades and you haven't even acknowledged that at all. Just be better. That's all we're asking. Just be a human being. There's a lot of that that could apply to Jerry Reinsdorf. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of the, the, the afraid of the cameras thing is where I, I got like a flutter in the cockles oh, of my yeah, heart. Yeah. yeah. That hits really right there. Doesn't it just get you, <laughs> just get you right in the good place. Yeah. I, I mean, I, we had Lance Lynn and, and, and Middleton, right? We had, we had those guys walking away saying there's a culture problem with the white Sox and sort of ripping the franchise, but they didn't specifically call out Jerry. You're right. They like, they, they said the franchise was, it was a bad place to work. But they didn't actually sit there and say, sell the team, Jerry. Go go ahead and sell the team and then like just tear a manu on the way Trevor May just did with the even with the A's owner. I I mean that that kind of thing is I think part of it is is that you can maybe only have the freedom to say that when you're done with the game of baseball, right? Because now nobody no other team would sit there and, and take a take a chance on this guy coming out and eviscerating the owner somewhere else or, you know, anything like that. But, but he's done, right? He's done with the game. And now he can go on MLB network and just rip all the owners he wants to rip <laughs> and make a nice little post post playing career for himself. Well, you got, you got to be Trevor May to do it, right? Like you've got to be a yeah, player. That's true. You've got to be a player that doesn't have a lot post career in baseball going for them. Right? Like, here's a guy, they're not erecting a statue for a relief pitcher with a 4.24 ERA. No, no nobody is, nobody's going to notice Trevor May retired. He's not worried about being called back one day to have his number retired. So he can rip the organization and move on and never care if they don't ever invite him back in for, like, Veterans Day because he wasn't getting invited back anyway. So, I mean, like, you need a guy like that. That retires, I think it's got to he's got it's got to be in the sweet spot of he really doesn't care and he has nothing to lose. Well, he wasn't even with the team that long. This was his only season in Oakland. 
was 2023. Oh, yeah, he spent it is. most of his career with the with the Twins and a couple years with the Mets. I misread that. I was looking at I was looking at his overall career and the way the article was written. I didn't see that. Now I see that in the paragraph. He was only with the Ace for a year and he rips the guy up the way up. The yeah. Door. So I love it. One year, it's all it took him. All it took him was 49 <laughs> games to understand what a pile of garbage the Oakland A's it. ownership is. I love and, it. And and he's not even he's not even talking about Steve Cohen or saying anything bad about the Twins. If only Trevor May could have played one more year and played for the White Sox, and we could have gotten it out of him. Just a you know shame. what, Trevor, come on back, Just man. We're gonna need shame. this. We're gonna need a. We're gonna need some relief help anyway. <laughs> so come on back. <laughs> this episode of Socks in the Basement and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by the place for White Sox pregame, postgame, viewing parties, Cork and Carry at the park, thirty third in Princeton in the shadow of the ballpark, the home of the podcast for fans by fans. Socks in the Basement with an award winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites, two for one burgers when you dine in on Mondays, and uh, still a great place to hang out in the off season. Meet up with White Sox fans. Another great place to hang out, uh, Cork and Carry Beverly, 10614 Southwestern Avenue, an, an incredible outdoor area. I know it's been a little chilly. We're going to get some 60s. We're going to get some 70s. I'm looking ahead at the next week or so. We're going to get that last bastion of fall and being out on that patio is great. And the bar is really big inside now. It used to be just a tiny little pub and there's so much room in there now. Uh, and and you, when you walk in, it's like walking into some place in Ireland uh, and they've got an extensive bar there as well and some really friendly people. See everything at corkandcarry.com. Uh, let's also, when we're talking about dysfunctionality in in other organizations, And how it relates back to the White Sox. Let's not forget about what happened to Kim Ng this week. And I love the stories by the national media about the general manager or former general manager of the Marlins who acquired Jake Berger in a steal this this season and got her team into the postseason. She was told they wanted to pick up her option, but she was also told we're going to hire somebody to be above you and you're going to keep your same position. And she declines her option. And what's funny is all the national media is writing like headlines or it's in their articles how the Marlins parted ways with her. The Marlins didn't part ways with her. She parted ways with the Marlins. Thank you. And the Marlins disrespected her and she said, I'm out. Right. Because somebody else is going to want me. And she's being mentioned for all these other jobs in Major League Baseball already. She did exactly what anybody with a good head on their shoulders would have done. But I find it to be such lazy reporting to try to suggest the White Sox. She started her career here at the lowest level in the front office in the 90s and then left and went and had success and moved up the ladder with other organizations. She, she's not part of the White Sox club from what I can tell. You have to remember, and I think the younger fans might not know this, but there was like a bloodletting in that front office towards the back end of the 90s. There were a lot of people with very strong opinions as to what the White Sox should do and how much money Jerry Reinsdorf should be spending, and he doesn't like that. So he brought in guys who were family, who would listen to him, who would let him walk in and it would be like a like a group thing where they would all sit around and talk about it, and that's Kenny and eventually Rick getting in the room and all that other stuff that lasted for the last 20 years. She ain't a part of the good old boy network inside that building. So I think saying that she's coming back is quite a stretch. I'm sure she ain't even thinking about coming in to this dysfunctional organization after leaving an organization that just did what they did to her. And it would be great to have her come in. But Chris Getz is your guy, folks. I'm not even entertaining the possibility of her walking in the door. Well, and there's no reason for her to walk back in this door. So you give her Kenny Williams' old role of of president of baseball operations or vice president of baseball operations, whatever he was, CEO of doing nothing but acting shocked when things don't go your way. I, I don't I don't see where she benefits from that because if she wants to be the general manager of a team or if she even wants to be the president of a team, she's walking in the door to where Jerry Reinsdorf is an owner she's familiar with and presumably, like you said, remembers what he was 20, 30 years ago and isn't really interested in doing that again. Knows that there's a lot of useless walking around the building that just gets to stay because they've been there for a long time. Like She knows how this place but, but, works. But even, even regardless of that... Why on earth would she walk into a situation where she cannot hire her own general manager? There's already all sorts of hires that Chris Getz has made that she can't just immediately undo. She's walking into a situation where she really has no decisions to make. So that that doesn't do her any good in her career. That's not fun. What what's the point of it? I you know, it 
this is like fantasy baseball reporting for the front office of the White Sox. Let's just add a bunch of big names that we think are going to be more successful than anything the White Sox have had and just assume that that's how that works. When you talk about lazy reporting, that's really kind of where it's at because what forethought goes into the idea that that she belongs in the White Sox front office or that she would have any dang interest in walking in here with Chris Getz already in place, with Josh Barfield already in place, with Gene Watson already in place, Brian Bannister already in place, Getz doing all the things that he wants to do, presumably, plus knowing Jerry, plus, like you said, knowing the culture of the team anyway, that there are people walking around there like zombies who have just been getting a paycheck and getting to say they work for the White Sox for God knows how long, just because they they agree with the right people, there's nothing to be gained. She's better off going and rescuing the Red Sox. That's where I'd go if I were And her. turning them into a contender and, and taking more power from their ownership yeah. than she is walking in here. That's an ownership group that gets out of the way. They just pay you a salary, tell you what your budget is, and lets you work. That's not how the White Sox operate. No. Right? No. So, I mean, like, if you're if you're out there and you've got a resume and there's already people with a buzz, like, we'd like to see her come into this place or come into that place, that that's that's who ends up getting her if they want her. If they want her, she'll end up over there. Uh, for all of you out there that own your own business, big or small, uh, Butch Zemar, big White Sox fan who's been on this show a couple of times, is right there in the thick, in the middle of open enrollment, for insurance. And, you know, you might not think it's a big deal. You might figure, hey, it always goes up every year. Uh, You know, why would I switch? Why would I go with a broker? Uh, What Butch does is he finds the best deal. He's going to sit there and he's going to tell you this insurance company, this insurance company, this insurance company, they're all basically the same. But this one over here is going to treat you better. And this is what you're actually spending on it. And this is what your employees are actually using insurance wise. So why are you spending money on this other thing that nobody uses? How can you save money for the employee and then save him money for the business. And, and that's a big deal. And people kind of forget about that. Butch right now will give you a free evaluation. All right. He's going to open up the elite benefits playbook. He's going to talk to you about it and he's going to try to find you something better. And he's going to get you started right now. And then he's going to grow with you and help you in the future years as well. It's very difficult to run a business. It's very difficult to hold on to employees. Good benefits is a big deal and keeping that bottom line as low as possible. Reach out to him today, 708-535-3006, or email him, butch at elitebenefits.net. Speaking of all those guys that were brought into the front office uh, and, and and the gentleman that came over from Kansas City, the, the rumor about Sal Perez and Whit Merrifield is sitting in a vacuum right now in the world of White sox and it's still just lingering out there, right? Like, we talked about it already, then I got asked about it on Future Sox, which is also on the broadcast basement on demand radio network. And they have me on this week. And I got asked about it there. And I could tell that those guys are arguing about Whit Merrifield and is he worth something? And would you bring in Sal Perez? And and I'm gonna tell you first off, from what I've heard in the grapevine, there is there is a connection between some Chicago sports journalist and some of the guys that have been brought in. So I don't doubt that there aren't already sources that are established where you might actually be hearing something that's true, that they may be looking at a Sal Perez or Whit Merrifield. In fact, I've already heard that the old regime knocked on the door of Kansas City because Pedro wants Sal Perez so badly, but that the the Royals actually thought they were going to get good prospects. <laughs> wow. For, for, Come on for, now. A, for a replacement level catcher who's at the back end of his career and that they owed 40 some million dollars to. And they thought they were going to get high end prospects for him. So, I mean, as dumb as Kenny and Rick were, they weren't that dumb at the trade deadline. Now, it'll it'll now come down to, I believe, they want him. How much will they have to give up and how much money are the Royals going to take off of that deal? And what is the exchange going to be to get a trade done? It's a scary thing, but I think it's going to happen. I really believe that after hearing all that. If this is something that the, the organization's been curious about and that Pedro's clearly pushing for, and I feel like he is after hearing what I've heard, okay, what is it going to cost the team and what's the value? I believe you get him in here and he's not costing you 20 a year, but he's costing you 7, 8, even 10. And you just need that guy to fill in until you find your catcher, until Edgar Carroll gets up here. And you just want to bring in a guy that's going to hit 20-some home runs, have an, have an OPS that's slightly below average. Like his OPS plus, I think, last year was like a 96 or something. It might have been a 90, 93. I don't know. I have to look it up. But but he was. I, I remember looking at it. He was in like the mid-90s, which means he's just below what the average was for the league. 
and you, you bring in that guy, the veteran leadership, you feel like you need that guy. Pedro can't find a leader. He wants to bring him in. If you're not paying a ton of money, he isn't blocking anybody, folks. I really don't think he is. I, I You know, you, you got to develop prospects while you still have guys that are actually Major League Baseball players. He's still a Major League Baseball player. It all depends on how much the Major League Baseball player costs. Like, in my mind, all nine positions out there should be filled with a Major League Baseball player whose replacement level who can actually go out and play the game and you're not going to have to worry about the ups and downs and the fact they can't figure out what they're they're capable of doing and you're trying to develop five guys at once, right? You can't develop five guys at once at the major league level. And then when you have a guy that comes along who's been killing in AAA and it's his turn, you move that guy out of the way because he didn't cost that much. But then he's sitting on the bench in case that kid after he gets 100 or 200 at bats is terrible. Now that kid didn't work out and the replacement level guy moves back into the position. And having a guy like Sal Perez, a catcher, makes sense to me, Ed, as long as you're not paying a ton of money for him or giving up something that is going to be playing against you for the next 10 years. And you'll be like, how do we give this guy up for Sal Perez? Well, and, and the, the idea of Sal Perez isn't the problem. The idea of Sal Perez coming to the White Sox to be that leader, to be that that carryover to Edgar Caro, all those things that, that that all makes perfect sense for the White Sox. Even the money, even if they decided that they were going to eat the salary, that's a type of move we're really asking Jerry to make. As long as it doesn't cost them the ability to do something else, bringing in both of them, bringing in both Merrifield and Sal Perez. You're just adding age onto a team that you're trying to rebuild, and they're not going to be here long enough to really make a a huge impact. But, okay, you know, that all aside, the problem with the Sal Perez thing is is that if Rick and Kenny already knocked on the door for the Royals and the Royals expect something good in return, that tells you what they have in terms of how they value Sal Perez. You keep calling him a replacement-level catcher, which is statistically true. However, he's also kind of a Kansas City Royal legend, right? So That's right. They got to get something back for him or they look really bad. Or they they look they, terrible. And they, yeah, and 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 he's still viable. He's not uh, I mean he is on the downslope of his career, but he still had a pretty good year this year. So you you're 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 looking at this, you know, from a White Sox standpoint, you're right. It makes sense to to bring this guy in as a replacement level catcher, uh to bring him in at a reasonable amount of money to to have all of those leadership skills and everything. And I'm sure Pedro w- would absolutely agree. But the fact is, is that Sal Perez, from a Royal standpoint, is still a superstar. They will erect a statue of that man at some point, right? And it's not going to be as easy for the Royals to justify giving him up for pennies on the dollar. Even in a salary dump, it's not going to be easy for the Royals to justify that. So that's where I sit there and go, okay, I, I think it's a it's an idea... I'm sure Gene Watson would love to have him. I'm sure Pedro would love to have him. You know, these are the guys with the Royals ties. And I'm sure that every other team in baseball in some way, shape, or form would look at Sal Perez and go, we can make that guy work in this organization somehow. You can't tell me that the Astros wouldn't love to have Sal Perez instead of Martin Maldonado. You couldn't tell me that there's, you know, a need for him in New York with the Mets or the Yankees. There's there's plenty of places that would love to have Sal Perez. It's just a question of who wants to pay the Royals price. And if you're the White Sox, I don't know that it's worth paying the Royals price. Now, Whit Merrifield's probably going to be a free agent. Nobody's giving Whit Merrifield eighteen million dollars. Like that's what his, exactly that's what his option is. So he's going to be a free agent. But I would take. But I wouldn't want Whit Merrifield. Well, I, I would take I would take Whit Merrifield if he's willing to do the the utility player role and play a little second play, base, play a little outfield. You know, badly, badly. You got to put in the word badly. He's a defensive liability. I, I I understand. I understand that he plays all these things badly. But if you're if you're talking about just veteran leadership and you're putting the guy out there and you're not going to play him 156 games out of the year, I, you know, and and he comes cheap. Okay, you know, I'd kick the tires on the guy anyway. I mean, that's 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 a bench guy, right? That's harmless. That's a glue guy right there at that point. And and at this point in his career, maybe that's there's some value there, but. I think of of the discussion of like bringing the guy in for for cheap or for a reasonable price to to get those intangibles. Merrifield is probably more likely in my mind than paying the Royals king's ransom for the legend of Sal Perez because that's what they're trading away is the legend of Sal Perez, not the replacement level thirty five year old catcher. Listen, if I were, if I were this team, I still go back to the idea that you would move on from TA, you'd save the thirteen million dollars, you'd re-sign Elvis Andrus, and you put and, and after the Twins, don't pick up the club club option on 
uh, Jorge Polanco, which I don't think that they will. Uh, you go, you sign him for like a two, three year deal. Actually, you know, you know, the other guy that I, I would want to kick the tires on if I'm the White Sox is Ahmed Rosario. Yeah, I would kick the tires on Ahmed Rosario, 28 years old. He's a major league baseball player. He's yeah. a major league baseball player who's got who has over the last two years his F war is 2.9, and he's only 28 years old. I mean, like, like that's the kind of guy you need some middle infielders. Even when Montgomery gets here, you're still going to need another person to sit in the middle infield with him. Okay, you could go and get that guy instead if you don't want to bring back Andros. These there are names out there that I like better than Whit Merrifield. Like I like Tony Kemp better than Whit Merrifield. I yeah, like yeah, I like yeah. Adam Frazier better than Whit Merrifield. Like they're just focusing in on Whit Merrifield. Because he's familiar to the manager, and the manager stated publicly, I can't find any leaders on this team, right? So he's like, I know this guy, and it, this is like a comfort thing, the Whit Merrifield thing. Like, this is the one, like, like, like you're going to get him at a good price. He's not going to be like you have to trade away prospects, and you got to pay, you got to overpay him like what Sal Perez is going to be, right? So, I mean, he's, a, he's almost like a no harm, no foul acquisition, like, if they bring him in, trust me, Whit Merrifield is not going to be a major part of the team in 25 and 26. What, what we're really talking about is is one of one of these guys is Pedro's teddy bear. One of these guys is Pedro's security blanket, right? So which one's cheaper, the blankie or the teddy? But I would rather have a guy like Polanco who you could have for a couple of years on the team and solve a problem. I would rather have a guy like Rosario who you would have on the team for a couple of years who would solve a problem. Yeah, Rosario Rosario's a guy that could actually be a longer-term Yes, piece to this team, too, because if you're not talking about Ahmed Rosario as a star, but you're talking about him as a guy who can play second base and do it very competently or shortstop or shortstop. Yeah. I mean, like, here's the thing. Like, look, you give me the money right now from from Tim Anderson and, and I'm out there trying to grab a guy like that. I'm out there trying to grab some of these other names that I'm saying. I'm not trying to grab Whit Merrifield. Like he's not, he's not my plans. I don't want the 35 year old. Whit Merrifield's a minor league contract and an invite to spring training is really where he should be. He's a 35 year old who doesn't play defense very well. Who's on the downslope of his career. And the only reason he's being mentioned is because the guy who's the manager needs a teddy bear or a blanket. That's exactly what it is. I mean, and that's, he's the scarier thing to me because I think Sal Perez, I mean, get out of the way of the money. And let's be honest, it's not my money. Not my money. I, I, I don't care. care. That's what I say. I, if, if it doesn't cost Chris Getz from being able to fill another hole, go ahead and pay Sal Perez his full freight. Hailstorm Brewing Company is the official brewery of Sox in the Basement with a Scratch Kitchen, now open at 11 a.m. for lunch Tuesday through Sunday, and that kitchen sticks around all day into the evening. Try all of the different beers they have up there. They have quite a selection. In fact, Southside Pod just did a feature there. There's going to be a video up this week uh, showing all the different beers they're doing. They're bringing back one of their old favorites, like a, a Belgian triple that like people get super excited about whenever it comes out. They've got Dominatrix, one of the best IPAs out there. Take me to your liter if you're still looking for Oktoberfest beers. They're going to be getting into the winter beers. Yeah, look, I like going to breweries and exploring beer. To me, I like going into a place and trying different things that they have. I like getting the samplers every once in a while and then also knowing there's a couple of them up there that I know I love once I get settled in. I like being able to get food when I'm at the place that's really good instead of having to order a pizza and have them walk it down the street. And it's just That's just me. This is a big beer hall that's got great food you can bring the kids into if you want to, or you go there late night and you have a good time with your friends. Uh, this is definitely a spot you want to check out in Tinley Park, 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. See more at hailstormbrewing.com. I am very concerned at this moment that the Texas Rangers will not lose another game. They may not. They may not lose another game. This is going to take away from the the greatest postseason run ever of 11 and one in 2005. I root every year for everybody to get at least one loss. And when they all have their second loss of the playoffs, I know we're safe. Like I know we're tied with the Yankees team in the nineties, but who cares about them? The white Sox are better, right? Exactly. That 2005 white Sox team needs to hold on to that. And somebody going 13 and one is going to be the greatest, most dominating run in postseason history. So everybody needs two. Like, because now it's 13 games. 13 and one is better than 11 and one. So we need to see two losses from the Rangers in this postseason if they go on to win the World Series, or we're no longer the most dominant team. So, as much as I enjoy them beating the Astros, I would like to see Houston get a game or two here. 
I would like it when the Phillies eventually get to the World Series, like I said they were going to get to the World Series, way back when, and they are just running through everybody. And I know there are doubters out there every time I say it, but I'm telling you, that's the team of destiny right there, okay? When when they get, maybe the Phillies are the ones that tag a few on them, and they actually just win the thing. Right now, the, the Rangers being undefeated makes me nervous as a Sox fan. See, and I, I guess I, I have some belief in the Phillies. I'm... I'm really happy to see the Astros getting it handed to them because it's just long overdue. They're, they're, they were starting to get on my nerves. But I will, you know, it, whether it's a shout out to my brother in law who's from Philly and is a huge Phillies fan uh, and reminds me about Bryce Harper all the time for some reason. Oh, um, I mean, every time he does well, I'm happy for him and I hate Jerry Reinsdorf just that much more. more. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I honestly, I think that the Rangers and the Phillies match up really, really, really well in terms of the team of destiny feel about both of them. So I think the the World Series could end up being something of a uh, of a back and forth where you're not going to see you're not going to see one of those teams sweep the other one out of the out of the series. Those two teams are the greatest indictment on how poorly the White Sox are run. Uh, aren't they? Those two teams are teams that developed players went into kind of like a build mode for a little while there. Uh, and then they they spent the money when it was time to spend the money. Like the White Sox talked about spending the money. Yeah, we, we heard the money will be spent. We just didn't realize it was only going to be on Yasmani Grandal and Dallas Keuchel. Right, but they went and spent the money. They went and got the big free agent when they needed to. While the old man sits up there with his stogie, and talks about how he'll never pay this much or give this many years. He'll never do those kind of things because it's bad for baseball and it's bad for his pocketbook. The two teams that ignored that are going to go to the World Series and play this year, are going to have packed places, are going to have fan bases that were rewarded for the, the, the lean years. And that's why he's a crappy owner. That's why he's a terrible owner. That's why I hate the fact that he's my owner. And that's why I can't wait till he's not the owner anymore. Because until you get a guy that's willing to do the extra little bit to get you in there, you're just a team with a puncher's chance at getting into the postseason and then hopes that a miracle happens where you can make a run. Because those two teams were built not only to win 162, but to go into the postseason and win, and they're showing it right now. And it's because those guys went out and got a couple of actual name-free agents and made the moves at the end where they gave big money to a couple of stars that are leading their teams to victory. Yeah, and, and, you know, this is also one of those things, too, where when you're talking about the White Sox being in a competitive window, how ludicrous the last couple of seasons have been because people are up in arms over the fact that the, that the Phillies are doing this well because they're, you know, all of the division winners are, are out, right? All of, except for, uh, you know, except for one. All the division winners have been eliminated. So, you know, you have wild card teams that are competing for the World Series now. And, and you know, it's not fair that these teams were great for 162 games and then, you know, they have a, a couple of bad games in the playoffs and they're gone. I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I actually, I mean, first of all, the Rangers were really good this year, okay? They actually dealt with a lot more adversity and injury and stuff like that. I mean, think about some of the names that they lost along the way in terms of like Jacob deGrom, for gosh sakes, you know, that, that they still overcame it. They didn't have a full season out of Corey Seager. Once again, they, they just, they just kept churning players out and they kept churning out wins and they kept coming. And so I think that they deserve to be in the, in the conversation, the Phillies, you know, okay. So they're, they're an example of how a team could be built to finish second, Jerry, and still actually make it into the playoffs under the current format. So if you're going to sit there and, and not make the moves to make you a dominating team, but you're you're still going to be incompetent enough to not even put together a team that could fall backwards into the playoffs and have a puncher's chance in the playoffs, which the White Sox should have had every one of these years just based on talent alone in certain situations, in certain positions, I should say. I don't understand how this happens coming off of uh, of those lean years where you're bringing up all these players and you can't find me some major league players to fill in where you don't have the prospects enough to at least get yourself in the wild card conversation every year, let alone win a division where this year the, the AL central was just dog meat. 
the entire year. I mean, it's not, was it anybody surprised that the twins didn't really do much? The AL central has been garbage for years upon years upon years. Right. The White Sox should be perennially in the postseason. And you know what? This expanded playoffs thing just showed up a little bit too late, right? Imagine expanded playoffs in the nineties. How many more times the White Sox would have had a chance oh, man. to the, win a world series. Do you series, think the white right? flag trade happens? It doesn't. And imagine the White Sox having this expanded playoffs in 2006. Right. Where they just fall short. They would have been in the playoffs. Exactly. But the problem is Jerry looks at that and doesn't realize that the way the teams were built back then was the right way to do it. And it's fallen into this new thing where it's like, I just need to make it close and hope that we can get in. No, no, no. Those teams were built to actually win, fell a little bit short, and it was unfortunate. And now when you're built to win and you fall a little bit short you actually still get a chance. You might have a shot. And that, and that needs to be the focus moving forward. It's not It's not trying to get into the playoffs. Like, you can't sit there and say, well, if we win this many games, we're a wild card team, so that's our goal. That should not be your goal. Your goal has to be to win the division and to be one of the best teams in baseball. And then if you fall short of that goal, you still have a team that may have dealt with a little bit of injury, may have gone on a bad losing streak, may not have fulfilled the division title goal, but still makes it into the playoffs and then surprises everybody because they're suddenly healthy. They've got a little bit of attitude. They got the right players in there. They got a few stars and now they're doing what the Phillies are doing. And that that's, that's how you build the baseball team in this current era. But then again, we're talking about the White Sox who generally are about 10 years behind major league baseball every single time. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.